Ar-Rahman. You are the first to follow creation. A single name stamped across eternity among the many names I may call you, but the closest to my lips when I pray. I call upon you and the earth and sky are open palms nearly clasping, disposed to give blessings to all the denizens of your blooming garden. Just as the sun shines without disparity, I may pick the fruits of your benevolence freely, a creature who was made for deliverance, planting questions in the ground. Does the sun also rise and set within my very own heart? Am I both eternally loved and eternally able to love? I do not know the answers, but the blessing is in the asking, and your gifts still arrive in baskets readily laid at my feet. In them I find sunlight made material, wheat and holy water, butter, milk, and sugar, all the ingredients for Sukrit. as If we lived backwards, our deaths would simply be births, and our chests would still heave even as oxygen left our lips, and the trees would accept it as offering. We would all begin large and ancient, and we would grow smaller together and gradually weaker, but softer this time with each passing year until we reached our origins. And through it, we would continue to gaze upward at the stars and the dark matter in between, just as our ancestors, now descendants, would do after us. The sun would chase the moon, and an eclipse would remain an eclipse. Al-Mu'min, I wear Allah's name with pride emblazoned across my chest in golden medallion or silver sword and tied tightly to my wrist in green and red thread. But mostly I wear my faith tucked underneath my shirt my prayers pressed inwardly like a fingernail digging into wet clay, an instrument that gives shape to unfinished material, to a body with a history you can only guess at. I have shivered with doubt, the way someone guarding a precious thing should never do. I have craved nothing, and yet been famished all the same. I have felt such pain that my worship turned to dust in my mouth, these delicate recitations dissolving upon my tongue like filigree. And I have arisen the next day to bless the messenger and his progeny. Thank you so much.
The problem of fragmentation in our world is not a problem of diversity. Diversity itself should be a source of enrichment. The problem comes when diverse elements spin off on their own, when the bonds that connect us across our diversities begin to weaken. Too often, our world grows more complex. The temptation for some is to shield themselves from complexity. We seek the comfort of our simplicities, our own specialities. And often, as, as has been said, we risk learning more and more about less and less. And the result is that significant knowledge gaps can develop and persist. That danger is that knowledge gaps so often run the risk of becoming empathy gaps. The struggle to remain empathetically open to the other in a diversifying world is a continuing struggle of central importance for all of us. And the danger of having knowledge gaps grow into empathy gaps. That was the theme of my address in 1996. I discussed then what was becoming an enormous knowledge gap, nearly an ignorance gap, between the worlds of Islam and the non-Muslim world. Since that time, to be sure, there have been moments of encouraging progress on this front, including academic-centered efforts here at Brown with your wonderful digital Islamic humanities program. But in many ways, that knowledge gap has worsened. We've heard predictions for some years now about some inevitable clash of the industrialized West with the Muslim world. These multiplied, of course, in the wake of the 9-11 tragedies and other violent episodes. But most Muslims don't think that way. Only an extreme minority does. For most of us, there is singularly little in our theology that would clash with the other Abrahamic faiths, with Christianity and with Judaism. And there is much more in harmony. What has happened to the Islamic tradition that says our best friends will be from the other Abrahamic faiths, known as the people of the book, all of whose faith builds on monotheistic revelation. یا علی مدد خوش آمدید با تشکر از شما برای سهم گیری در قسمت دیگری از باستاب جمعه شب اسم من آلیشا کامینز است و افتخار دارم که از تمام اعضای جماعت اعضای خانواده های آنان با باورهای مختلف عقیدتی و افراد دیگری که در سراسر جهان ما را تماشا می کنند استقبال می نمایم از این که امشب میزبان شما می باشم بسیار هیجان زده هستم هفته ای پر مشغله در سراسر کشور بود کسانی که مصروف کار هستند سعی دارند تا کارهای ناتمامشان را به اتمام برسانند و خود را برای فصل تعطیلات آماده می سازند بچه ها از مکتب و مدرسه مرخص می شوند و امیدوارم بسیاری از شما فرصتی برای استراحت و صرف وقت با خانواده را داشته باشید چه به شکل حضوری و چه از طریق فضای مجازی و آنلاین امروز البته یک روز بسیار ویژه در تقویم مسیحی است زیرا روز تولد حضرت عیسی پیامبر است و بنابراین مناسب است که در این روز ما فرصتی برای بحث در مورد ارزش های مشترک بین ادیان ابراهیمی یعنی یهودیت، مسیحیت و اسلام و همه کسانی که از آموزه های حضرت ابراهیم پیامبر پیروی می کنند داشته باشیم با وجود تفاوت های دینی بسا مسائلی اند که ما را با هم دیگر پیوند می دهند چه در باورهای من، چه در اخلاق و ارزش های من. در عصر زمان امروز داشتن اتحاد با سیستم های اعتقادی مختلف برای نایل شدن و رسیدن به اهداف مشترک اهمیت بیشتری پیدا می کند اگر با هم باشیم قویتر هستیم 
امیدوارم از کلیپ مولانا حاضر ما هم در ابتدای نمایش لذت ببرید چون در مورد میراث مشترک ما صحبت می کند و حال افتخار دارم که حیعت سخنرانان محترم امشب ما را معرفی می کنم کاردینال کالینز از قف اعظم تورنتو و رئیس دانشگاه مؤسسه از قفی مطالعات قرون وستا است آلی جناب در سال 1978 مجوز خود را در مورد کتاب مقدس از انستیتیوت انجیل مقدس و در سال 1986 دکتورای الهیات را از دانشگاه گریگوریان دریافت کرد. او در سال 2007 به عنوان اسقف اعظم تورنتو منصوب شد. در سال 2016 وی ریاست مراسم را به عهده داشت که به مرامولان حاضر امام به خاطر کمک های بشر دوستانش دکتورای افتخاری اتا گردید. دانشمند یهودی خاخام دکتر رابرت داوک یک استاد یاور و رهبر برنامه تنوع و نوآوری در مرکز گفتگوی موریس جی ویسک دانشگاه سایمون فریزر است که در آن عضو دعوت شده در حیط علمی بوده است. و از سال 2010 تا 2016 استاد همکار و افتخاری در دیپارتمنت مطالعات کلاسیک و مذهبی خاور نزدیک بود. و ای دکترای خود را در رشته مطالعات خاور نزدیک از دانشگاه برکلی و مدرک خاخامیش را از مؤسسه مطالعات یهودی اخص کرد. سومین نظب حیات ما دکتر فاروق میتا از دانشگاه ویکتوریا است. جایی که استاد, هم... استاد و همکار علمی در بخش پژوهشی در دانشکده آموزش و پرورش است. وی در حال حاضر مدیر علمی برنامه تحقیقاتی و تحصیلات تکمیلی در مؤسسه مطالعات اسلام اسماعیلی است. کارشناسی ارشد خود را از انستیتوت مطالعات اسلامی دانشگاه مگیل و مدرک کارشناسی ارشد دیگری در آموزش بین المللی از دانشگاه لندن به دست آورده است. و همچنین دارای دکتورای ادبیات انگلیسی و آموزش از دانشگاه ویکتوریا است. برای آغاز گفتگو و پیش زمینه ما کلیپ را از سخنرانی کارن آرمسترانگ در مرکز آقا خان در لندن که در سال 2018 در مورد پلورالیسم جهانی صحبت نموده است پیشکش شما می نماییم. و به دنبال آن بحث پانل یا حیات امشب را که در اوایل هفته ضبط شده است تقدیم شما عزیزان می کنیم. بیایید یک نگاهی بیاندازیم Well, just let's take a look at the world. It seems to me that at the moment, we, what we're seeing is a kind of disease of nationalism, possibly nationalism in its last gasp. What the religions t all tell us, I, I've been writing a, a book about scripture at the moment in all religious traditions, and they all insist that enlightenment insists on overcoming the ego. A lot of it is ego. We're hearing it in our politicians at the moment, full, people full of themselves. But in, in, once you, this gets mixed up with religion, it is antipathetic. It's, it denies the whole process of religion, which is about uh, Islam, uh, which is about the surrender of the ego. The prostrations of Islam uh, enable, teach, the, you learn through the body about the profound uh, relinquishment of the ego that is required of the religious life. Uh, it, it, the uh, early Quraysh were horrified to see 
the Muslim, early Muslims groveling on the ground like a slave. But the prostrations teach the body uh, at a level deeper than the rational what is required in this. Uh, that instead of the ego that prances and preens and draws attention to itself, you bow your head to the ground. The word tolerance is, being, is often banded around when we talk about pluralism, but I really think we need to revisit this word. It comes, as you know, from a Latin root, tolerare, which means uh, to put up with something. Uh, it, it, it is to endure to bear something. Um, it's, it's not a wholehearted embrace. It's rather grudging. Now it's time, I think, perhaps to move beyond. The other word is compassion. Now that's not very satisfactory either, even though I've spent a lot of time working on this, because it's, the world has been weakened so much uh, over time. Uh, it's often associated with something rather sweet and gentle and nice. Um, or even associated with pity. When I go to, to feeling sorry for people, uh, again, it, it's putting you in a superior position where you feel sorry for these poor souls, feel compassion for them. Um, and, but in fact, compassion, if, if you look back to the root again, where tolerare meant to put up with something, compassion means, it comes from a Greek and Latin root, meaning to feel with the other that you are on the same level. And it is summed up in, 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 in the golden rule. Never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. Which means that you look that as Confucius, the first person to enunciate the golden rule in a way that was actually written down in his scriptures, said uh, you'd use your own feelings as a guide to your treatment with others. So you are on a level. You look into your own heart, discover what gives you, you pain, and then refuse under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. Never treat others. Confucius put it this way, do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. And he said you do this not just when you feel like it or, 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 or on a, a, an occasion, but as he said, all day and every day. And that means that all every day, all day, every day, you are gradually dethroning the ego from the center of the world, your world, and putting another there. And th it is that, Confucius said, that brings you to enlightenment. Um, and th the great, all the great traditions, all the great prophets enunciated this rule. Not one of you can be a believer, said the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, unless he desires for his neighbor what he desires for himself. Again, that sense of putting yourself in the shoes of the other. Uh, Rabbi Hillel was, uh, in the early second century in Jerusalem, was once asked by a pagan to sum up the whole of Jewish teaching while he stood on one leg. If you could do this, uh, the pagan said, I'll convert to Judaism. And Hillel stood on one leg and said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow human beings. That is the Torah. And everything else is only commentary. Go and study it. Love your enemy, said Jesus. Now, oh, again, another, this is another word that's been debased. Love, uh, in the English language. Uh, didn't you love that movie? Uh, I love ice cream, or it's, it's something sort of sentimental. No, um, he, the, Jesus is doing a bit of rabbinic midrash on a, uh, a ruling in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, where the, the, in Leviticus he says, love your neighbor. And Jesus is saying, now take that a bit further and love the enemy. Uh, he, the, the Hebrew word was hesed, which mean, meant loyalty. And it was a political term used in international treaties. Two kings would promise to love one another. And that didn't mean they would fall into one another's arms and become best friends, but they would look out for one another's interests. They would come to their aid even in time of trouble. 
they would take cognizance of that person's um, state, of, uh, state, even if it went against their short-term interests, and give them financial military support, whatever they needed. That is the kind of love we have to give to our so-called enemies today if we want a viable world. The Hindus said that every single human being, not even every single human being, but every single being, has at its core the Atman. Uh, 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 th that's its inmost, deepest self. And the, the, the it, uh, and that's in a tree or an insect or in the human being. And it's difficult to access that, you have to, 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 but you have to acknowledge it uh, be, and see that all these, these beings, each one of them, says so one of the sages, we all think ourselves so special and interesting and unique. But we are just like, uh, we're, we all have that same core, that same utter sacred core. And we're like a lot of rivers who all end up in the ocean. And once they're in the ocean, he said, they don't go around saying, well, I'm this river or I'm that river. No, they're just the ocean and we are just the divine. But again, uh, that's whatever faith tradition you're in. Your Eminence, Rabbi Dr. Dom, and Dr. Mita, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Alicia Cummins, and it's such an incredible privilege to have each of you here to discuss the importance of religious pluralism and to help us learn a bit more about some of the beliefs and shared values of the Abrahamic traditions. I would like to take a moment to allow each of you to make some introductory remarks about the significance of the Abrahamic traditions from your perspective and why it's important that we have a better understanding of this. So, Your Eminence, I'll start with you. Well, thank you very much. I, know I think it's very important to uh, see how these uh, different religions, these religious traditions, which are so widespread in the world, how they work together. Uh, I think, uh, the, obviously, uh, Christianity comes out of Judaism and uh, Islam comes later than that. So we have a one, two, three uh, kind of a uh, development historically. But oh, they're very different in so many different ways. But I think we all work together in many ways around the world. Uh, and I think particularly uh, just recently, well, a few years ago, I'm uh, meeting the Aga Khan and seeing, uh, talking with him about some of the great work that is done by the Ismaili community. Uh, and I remember visiting uh, the center uh, just up on the Don Valley Park where you can see it as you go up and uh, meeting with some of the people there and uh, noting for one thing, I think there was a Catholic who was one of the ones who were directing the museum there. So I think we work together in different ways. I, I would say that the these religions which have a certain connectedness because of history uh, also have a connectedness in the give, in the importance of justice and of love. Uh, there is a need for justice in the world and often where we cannot agree with one another on issues of faith, we do agree to work together on issues of justice. And as we can do that, caring for the most vulnerable, helping the needy as we are all in our different traditions seeking to do, then we get to know one another as persons and not as caricatures or cardboard cutouts or, or stereotypes. And as we do that, then we might be able after that to launch into uh, discussions of the important uh, spiritual and theological uh, doctrinal issues, which um, some of which unite us, but many of which divide us. So that's why I think that it's very important for us to get together in these conversations as we're doing right now, but also to get together in working in the shoulder to shoulder in the uh, helping the people who are most vulnerable. I think that's, uh, that's a great way we can start. I know that um, the great three great virtues, faith, hope, and love, faith comes first in many ways uh, because it gives us the vision. Hope gives us the energy, but love gives us the practical service. And I think that maybe in our relations with one another, it's love, hope, and faith. It starts with love and our practical service. Thank you so much, Your Eminence. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Dom, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Your Eminence, for your words as well. This is really important work. These are important conversations and, and really important relationships. 
um, like his eminence i i too have um found uh really quite inspiring um my visits to uh the museum uh in, in toronto and um to the local jamaat khanas um uh, there are so many ways in which uh, we 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 do work together um, with people of of uh, of no faith um, uh, and people who who do share uh, commitments to spiritual traditions to religious traditions, including um, our uh, our Christian and and Muslim uh, friends and neighbors, and for some family. Um, the irony is that, uh, in a sense, I suppose like a family. Um, you know, we we uh, we we have an awful lot in common, but we also have our own unique perspective and our own unique experience of the world. I remember when my late mother passed away. I was sharing a story with my my sister about one of the more important things I learned from her, and my sister said, "When did she say that?" And it 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 really struck me um, how profoundly unique uh, the relationship each of my siblings and I had had with our mother, and likewise. Um, each of us has a, a unique um, relationship with God, with the Creator, and with with also um, with our histories. Uh, I, I think the compl the problems we face in the world are so complex, whether it's the environment or or the um, enormous gulf between those who have and those who have not the resources to live, shelter, food, medical care, and and other challenges. The challenges of, of war and other conflicts of that kind, uh, the challenges of a deteriorating planet. These are vast challenges, and I think it requires the, the, the wisdom, uh, the compassion, uh, the commitments uh, of all of us uh, to, to face these challenges. So the irony is that those with whom we share the most history in some sense uh, are, are, are sometimes those with whom we um, we we will respectfully disagree about uh, important aspects of the stories, the traditions, uh, the practices, uh, the the beliefs. But at the same time, the fact that we have this shared history, that we have this deep family connection, uh, that we have overlapping and intersecting uh, histories and understandings of tradition and ideas, the more we can can embrace um, with respect. Uh, the differences, uh, as well as discover the commonalities uh, amongst us, I think the greater uh, the greater contributions we can make uh, to the world. Thank you so much, Dr. Dom, and over to you, Dr. Mita. Well, thank you, thank you, Alicia, for setting this up, and uh, an honor to be part of this conversation, or should I say, encounter. So a real honor to be with you, Your Eminence, and with uh, Rabbi Dr. Baum as well. I think in many ways, uh, what Your Eminence and what Dr. Baum has said, we are in a way embodying this by this very event that we're taking, taking part in. And of course, Merry Christmas to all, and a belated Happy Hanukkah uh, to all our Jewish friends as well. When I think of the term Abrahamic tradition, which is what, what was the title of this talk, and I think building on what has been said earlier, three, three ideas come to my mind immediately. The first is revelation, and especially this emphasis on what we share. This idea of the divine revealing itself in human history. And it's that sense in which, you know, God spoke to Abraham, and in a way, or how or in Islam we call him Prophet Ibrahim, he symbolizes that grace of divine communication that a God that continues to speak to humanity through subsequent prophets, for example, Moses, Jesus, and Prophet Muhammad. So in a sense, there's a, a common vision of a relationship with the divine, but it's a, it's a relationship that's unfolding in human history. And the second idea that comes to my mind, building on that is of scripture. The form in which that revelation arrives uh, toward us is through scripture. And it's that scripture in which, in a way, God's guidance is preserved and then communicated. And of course, when we talk about scripture, we're talking about text, we're talking about language, and language is open to interpretation. And I'd like to believe there is many ways to interpret scripture as there are believers. 
especially the visionary teachers and thinkers across the generations. And that's one of the most, um, for me, one of the most amazing things that we need to celebrate is how Jewish, Christian, and Muslim thinkers, in a sense, to use a term from music, rift off each other. Clearly in Andalusia, uh, in, in, in the, from the 8th to the so 15th or 14th century, where we talk about this convivencia, where you had Judeo-Arabic, the, the Hebrew language written in Arabic script. And you talk about someone, many of the great Christian thinkers later, someone like Aquinas, who read Muslim thinkers. And of course, Muslim, Muslim mystics and Sufis were deeply influenced by the traditions of mystical search and spiritual, uh, spiritual practices within both the Jewish and Christian communities. And the third term that comes to my mind, and I think this has been so eloquently sort of highlighted by both your eminence and Dr. Baum, is simply the word faith. And I know as you, your eminence, you quoted Corinthians, and when you talked about faith, hope, and love, and I know that the word love, I think in the, in the, uh, in the original Greek is caritas, perhaps, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And that, you know, you, you think, okay, well, you know, caritas has probably so many more meanings than what love can perhaps fully embody. But faith for me sometimes can be a synonym for so many things, but it is a human quest. Uh, just as life is a journey, faith is a journey for me. And that there's nobody who's not on this journey. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and in that sense, a quest for caritas, a quest for, for love. So when I think of revelation, scripture, and faith, and I think this is what we share, I think this, is, this provides us with an amazing sort of ground on which to enrich each other. I've always said that my faith is always deepened when I enter other spaces of worship. It's this idea of not taking my own faith for granted that I realize that when I enter another space of worship. And I think this is what, what, we, what we need to learn how to do is how we not only learn to understand each other, but deepen our own spirituality through these sort of encounters. Thank you so much, Dr. Mita. I'm going to ask, how can we build a better understanding of each other's tradition and to help advocate faith pluralism? So even with our differences um, and beliefs, how can we still advocate for religious pluralism? Um, Your Eminence, I'll start with you again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I think things like this are very helpful. And I remember when I was a student many years ago at the Hebrew University uh, in Jerusalem, uh, every day as I, before I went off to Mount Scopus to, for my classes, I would uh, celebrate Mass in Hebrew. Uh, it had been translated by Father Siasny of the monastery where I was living and had been approved by the Vatican. So it was a, um, it would be celebrating Mass in Hebrew and heading off to, uh, to class at, at the Hebrew University. So that kind of sharing together of experiences, I think, uh, it's, I found that it'd be a tremendous uh, background to my own uh, interest in Judaism and my own uh, involvement with it. I think that that helps very, very much. Also, the working together shoulder to shoulder in a lot of these uh, uh, different uh, struggles we face in terms of justice and love and charity and service. <clears throat> I think that's very important. The other issue I think that is very uh, important is that all of us are united by what we are facing in terms of uh, persecution. I think of Albania, for example where uh, there's a very good relationship between the Muslims, uh, the Orthodox Christians and the like, Greek or like Eastern Christians and the Roman Catholics, uh, the most famous of whom, of course, was Mother Teresa, the Albanian, um, <clears throat> because they were all terribly persecuted by Enver Hoxha, the uh, atheist uh, dictator of Albania. They all were in prison together. Uh, and so uh, they got to know one another, again, not as uh, cardboard figures, or stereotypes, but as people they disagree with on really profound things. So I would say the thing we face now is not the uh, horrors of persecution that the Albanian Muslims and Christians, and I think Jews, I'm sure too, faced, but uh, rather the sophisticated exclusion that is found in the secular, uh, secular humanism, in secular society, where the way to have freedom of religion is to have freedom from religion. Uh, and yet I would say uh, that 
Uh, there's no reason to believe that uh, sophisticated atheists or secularists have a privileged place at the democratic table, because I would say for certain that it is people of faith and many different faiths, not only the three that are represented here, but people of faith uh, who help those most in need. If you are homeless, if you are addicted, if you are facing issues of struggle in Toronto, my, my hometown here now, uh, it's likely going to be someone of faith who is there helping you, reaching out to you, caring for you. Um, and so it is, again, going back to what I was saying in the beginning, our, our faith motivates us. We are involved very much in helping the poorest and most vulnerable in society. And that's why I have no hesitation at all in stepping forward at the democratic table and saying we have, you may say, earned a place there, not only Catholics with the whole Catholic hospital system and the whole, all of that, the social service system, but the parallels in the Jewish tradition, the parallels in the Muslim tradition, I think in a very particular way, much of the work done by the Ismaili Muslims, uh, that people of faith are there. Um, we're boots on the ground, to use other images not very often used in our, our uh, scriptures. Uh, we're there. Uh, and therefore, in a world which tends to show uh, a multi, you can have a multi-religious or multi-view uh, society, and excluding the voice of faith, I think I would simply say, really? I don't think so. And so I, that gives me a certain confidence speaking up. That doesn't mean the people of faith should be saying vote for this party or that party or some other party. That's not the way to go. It's not a partisan thing. But it is a willingness to speak up in terms of society because when push comes to shove, we're there. And if we're there helping with a helping hand, I think we also are there to speak up and not let the public discourse, the public square be hijacked by people who believe they are scientifically preserved from faith and that they somehow are above it and beyond it because they're not. That's what a multi-faith, multicultural society means. It's not eliminate all, uh, you know, manger scenes and Hanukkah candles and everything and be sure that they're all cleared away so we can be neutral. No one's neutral. Even the uh, secular world is not very neutral. We should have them all together. We honor them all. That's what we need to do. Thank you so much. Yes, despite our differences and despite our um, theological um, viewpoints, you know, we have um, an opportunity to come together, as you said, to, to um, you know, combat um, common challenges. So thank you for that. Um, over to you, Dr. Dom. Thank you so much, and 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 thank you to to the card the cardinal for those um, those words. I think that what's so important about these um, these these relationships, these these encounters, is um, that they they're they're multifaceted. They come in different forms. You know, as as uh, as his eminence said, um, he used you know he pointed to a number of examples of of uh, collaboration in, in uh, addressing you know, public policy issues. And certainly there's um, plenty of opportunity for, for that work. And, uh, and in social services, of course, um, or responding to natural disasters and, and, and uh, focusing public attention on, on those who have been marginalized, neglected, um, uh, who don't have food on their tables or don't have access to, to, uh, to, to housing. Um, but there's also uh, another dimension that is is a little more difficult and, and 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 it's more complex and it's in the present day it's it's not in the spirit of seeking to you know to disconfirm the beliefs of the other or the validity or authenticity of the traditions of the other uh, i think we all we all know that here um uh it's it's there's an opportunity to engage in 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 really in-depth conversations encounters um, where we share more of a sense of the complexity and the richness and the profundity of our own uh, of our own spiritual journey uh, 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 of of the of the richness of the interpretive traditions uh, in our own community, 
and I think that we 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 will, as 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 my colleagues have pointed out, uh, uh, come away from those encounters not only with a deeper understanding of the other, but also of a of a of a perhaps a more nuanced understanding of ourselves. I I think it was only when I when I um, learned that um, uh, the the importance, if I may, for for uh, from, a, from the perspective of of of, uh, of Islam, um, of not being of not describing a uh, an edition, as it were, of the Quran in a language other than the classical Arabic. That it's not it's not a translation. It's a different work, right? It's an interpretation, and it's the sense that the Quran, as I understood it. Uh, exists in in uh, per se only in Arabic, right? Uh, it can't be translated. It can be interpreted, but uh, in its purest sense, it is in the Arabic uh, uh, language. And um, there's there are I, by learning that, I had a deeper understanding for the um, the, the fascinating um, tradition in Judaism uh, uh, around the the presentation. Of the of the when the Torah is read in public from the scroll, um, in our earliest tradition, uh, the teachers were uh, instructed to always be looking at the scroll itself, to be looking at the text when they're actually reading from the Torah, from the five books of Moses. Whereas when the uh, simultaneous or or accompanying um, uh, translation is being presented. In the vernacular uh, or in the common language of the of the people, uh, to the to the public, to the congregation, the person who is providing that that translation and all translation is interpretation, of course, um, is instructed to look out at the congregation so that the people watching will understand that the first text which was being recited, chanted, which was being read, was the scripture itself. The Torah itself, whereas what they were hearing, the uh, as a kind of interpretation or translation, was an interpretation. It was not the text itself, and it preserves that the distinction between the biblical text, the revealed text, and the interpretation of it, uh, and all interpretations of it. And I think it's understanding the significance of that. In in uh, the in, in Islamic tradition, that helps me to better understand the significance of the the oral tradition in Judaism, which is which is in its earliest stage of our history, not to be written down, never to be written down. I think we can come to understand each other better, as well as ourselves, through those kinds of uh, those kinds of encounters. And uh, and I hope that you know today is an example of that. It certainly is for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Dom. Dr. Mita. Well, you know, the good thing about coming last is all the wisdom has already been shared. <laughs> uh, so no, honestly, there's such a richness of what has been shared here, and hopefully this is a, a springboard for continuing conversations. But if I were to sort of now make sense of, you know, how this, uh, how this discussion is going, a key term that comes up for me is vulnerability, human vulnerability. And clearly, I mean, this is what the pandemic has taught us, if anything, how we are all equally vulnerable. And if we start with that assumption that as human beings, we share a common vulnerability, how would our understanding of our faith tradition be different? How would our understanding of life be different? Uh, and, you know, and in this idea of vulnerability is not only, I think, limited to this current pandemic crisis. We know, basically, about life on planet Earth. And we are trying to imagine what sort of timelines we have to work with and the type of urgency we need to, we need to take on to change uh, the way we live and consume on planet Earth. And that too is another sign of shared vulnerability. And so when you, know, when you talk about the wisdom in other traditions, these are, at least for me now, two nuggets of wisdom from both the Jewish and Christian tradition sort of have lit up for me. From the Jewish tradition, this phrase uh, that you have, tikkun alam, if I, if I got that pronunciation right, this idea of repairing the world, that the world is always in need of repair. 
But what is beautiful about it is it's, 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 it's always ongoing, right? We're never going to get it right. It's not like uh, there is uh, perfection that is going to be at hand. But the, the, what we need to perfect is how we work and keep on working in making the world a whole again, as the Kabbalists would say. And from the Christian tradition, I think what has influenced my religiosity is the idea of passion, the passion of Christ, uh, which of course passion from Latin comes from the Greek word pathos, suffering. There's an amazing, there's a, there's a remarkable sensitivity that then emerges from that idea of the passion of Christ to human suffering. And clearly it's the, the great art that has come out of that, right? The incredible art that came out um, throughout uh, European history that in a sense is so attentive to human suffering. One can't even think of the novel perhaps without thinking about what it means to talk about a character who faces all these troubles. But this idea of human suffering again is something that I, both human suffering and making the world whole again is another way of, of reminding us of our vulnerability and of our ongoing commitment. And, you know, I like what you said, uh, Your Eminence, this idea that a certain secular humanism can be tone deaf, uh, perhaps, to the contributions that, that faith traditions can make, that indeed religious institutions and religious communities can make. Um, and I think His Highness the Archon talks about the cosmopolitan ethic, the idea of what it means to think universally in terms of a cosmopolitan ethic. And that's something that we can work on. So perhaps there is room to talk about religious humanism, that we, what does it mean to articulate a religious humanism for our own times? Because in a sense, it has, it has to also dialogue with secular humanism. But there's such richness when you have a religious humanism that emerges. Uh, you know, I mean, the one way to talk about this is what would be the difference between talking about Christian theology as opposed to Christian spirituality or Jewish theology versus Jewish spirituality. A theological tradition lends itself to argument and polemics, but spirituality perhaps is a different, uh, uh, what's the word, different uh, ball game, and how it, it necessarily or inevitably for me is more inclusionary and more universalistic. I agree that, you know, one thing we need to avoid is talk about these things in abstract universal terms or in tokenistic ways that, you know, that, that we all are somehow together. But rather it's acknowledging that living with difference is difficult, but necessary. And, you know, the, the latest encyclical of the prophet, uh, of Pope Francis, uh, Brothers All, Fratelli Tutti, I believe it's in, um, in Latin or Italian. Um, but that, I mean, that takes courage for a Pope to be able to talk about that form of universalism, that we are all brothers together and the challenges he's talking about, which is the work that the Archon Development Network would find you know, in incredible resonance with, as with any many of the, the Jewish charities that I know as well. So ultimately, you know, I think when it comes to those universals, we are really much more, we are much more, you know, we are much more essentially rooted in something that is the same as when we are different. But this has really been an incredible honor and much for me to think about. So thank you for your, for sharing that you did. Thank you, Dr. Mita. And thank you all so much for, um, for sitting with us today and discussing the importance of religious pluralism and sharing your own beliefs and traditions and values and, um, and seeing how they align with a lot of what, you know, we all seem to have one thing in common, and that is, you know, to help the vulnerable and to unite together despite our differences to help those that are in need. So... With that, again, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and I hope that you all have a lovely holiday season, um, whether that is celebrating Hanukkah, Kushali, or Christmas. And hopefully um, the new year will bring us closer together um, to work closer together um, um, in the advancement of religious pluralism. Thank you. 
از حیات فوقلاده امشب ما به خاطر شریک ساختن افکارشان در مورد موضوع مورد بحث و این که چگونه با وجود داشتن تفاوتها ما پاره از اصول اخلاقی و ارزشهای مشترک داریم بسیار سپاس گذارم. ما افتخار داریم که شما را امشب با خود داریم. و امیدوارم که برنامه جالب و خانمادگی سال نو را در هفته آینده فراموش نکنید. ما یک برنامه ویژه برای باستاب جمع شب در روز سال نو در نظر گرفته ایم که پایان سال 2020 را جشن بگیریم و با کمی تفریح و خنده به سال 2021 داخل شویم. ما برنامه امشب را با گزیده ای از یک مراسم ویژه در سال 2016 به پایان می رسانیم. که در آن مؤسسه از قفی مطالعات قرون وستا قدیمی ترین مؤسسه تحقیقات علوم انسانی در کانادا و مولان حاضر امام دکتورای افتخاری هنر و ادبیات را به خاطر به رسمیت شناختن کارهای ایشان در زمینه پیش برد کسرت گرایی در جوامع اطراف دنیا تقدیم نمود این سند توسط عالی جناب کاردینال توماس کالنز در کلیسای کالج, کالج سنت بازیل در تورنتو به مولانا حاضر ما میتا شد موسیقی را که در ابتدای مراسم خواهید چنید پارچه دست جمعی می باشد تحت عنوان ادینو که بر رهبری حسین جان محمد تنظیم شده است این موسیقی بر بنیاد شعر از شاعر و فیلسوف مشهور مسلمان ابن العربی است که بر اساس عبارت معروف او الدین و بدین الحب ساخته شده است یعنی من پیرو دین عشقم که در نفس خود تعهد به ایمان است و در آغوش گرفتن تحمل مدارا و کسرت گرایی با خلق کردن این پارچه موسیقی صلح آمیز حسین صدای خانندگان ادیان گوناگون و بستگی ها، زبان ها و قومیت های مختلف را با استفاده از ملودی های سنتی کنار هم کشید و به ما کمک کرد تا تشخیص دهیم که وحدت و هماهنگی می تواند در تنوع و کسرت وجود داشته باشد. ما برنامه امشب را با دوگانه لیو پایان می دهیم که در حال اجرای یک نسخه از هالیلویا همراه با آلات موسیقی است. مثل همیشه از این که میزبان شما بودم لذت بردم. امیدوارم که نمایش امشب خوشتان آمده باشد. یا علی مدد و یک تعطیلات شاد برایتان آرزو دارم. with such great joy that uh, we welcome you here in our midst today. In this place which is so blessed to our whole community in the Roman Catholic Church, 
and indeed to our community beyond. Just recently, I had the privilege of visiting the Ismaili Center and the museum, which you have so graciously established in our midst, and marveled at the, the beauty that is found there and the desire to seek beauty, truth, and goodness, the great transcendentals which draw us all together. This institute was established many years ago with that purpose as well, as we seek those realities which are greater than our own individual egos. We are drawn closer to God, and we are drawn closer to one another. It is for this reason that people of faith, who so often are seen to be opposed to one another, and who have too often in history been engaged in violence, are in fact the great allies in the pursuit of beauty, truth, and goodness, and who can be in the context of a world so filled with violence and hatred, can be beacons of hope and of love. This is what you have consistently done over the years, to bring peace and to bring understanding. And so it is with that in mind that we in a very special way, appreciate your presence amongst us today and our prayers for God's blessing upon you and upon your community in the years ahead. This, uh, in our own area here in the area of Toronto and in Canada, the Ismaili community and the Catholic community are very similar to one another in our pursuits for so many things which are important in our society. And I recall as I visited the center and the museum, the opportunity to speak with members of the Ismaili community and to discuss some of the issues we face in our society, which is so often turned into a rather cold and harsh place because of the winds of secularism. And the light and the love of faith can break through that. So I pray for the Lord's blessing upon you and uh, upon your whole community. And I look forward in the years ahead to a deepening of love, friendship, and of common effort between our communities as a sign to the whole of society of that uh, profound effect of beauty, truth, and goodness, the pursuit of that for the benefit of all.